that morning, the child woke up and pointed to the rising sun. Look, father! His father looked and saw how the horizon burst slowly into crimson light. He heard the eager thrill of morning birds. He smelled the fragrant innocence of dawn. He felt the palm of his cheek, a child, on his cheek, as if for the first time. That day, in the cabinet of ministers, he announced, stop the shelling, end the war. Let us repair the damage we have done. Like a ripple on still waters, the murmur of change spread. Other fathers rose in boardrooms and chambers of commerce. Stop the selling of our souls for profit. Let us sow the seeds of care, and other fathers too, in councils and committees. Stop this madness of division and plunder. Let us regenerate the earth and ourselves. At that, a low drumming was heard as women stepped forward everywhere on earth their feet nurturing nature back to life. In their arms, they carried designs for the future. On their lips, they bore words of emergence. They joined hands with the men and formed a steady circle girding the earth. And there, they swore to build our topia, a world not of I, me, and mine, but of we, us, and ours. That's how they began, to co-create tomorrow, together, today. Imagine that. Imagine creating a world where everyone feels a sense of belonging, where every person feels connected to every living thing and to the earth that sustains us. Imagine if as of now, right here, we could put away the strife, the struggle, the competition, the drive to do more and more that consumes us but never satisfies us. And if right now instead we could devote the rest of our lives to following our calling, our dream, our passion, our gifts, to be of service to everyone. Imagine that this is both possible, essential, and is already happening around the world. You know, I grew up in India, and much as I adored my country, every day my heart would break at the depth of cruelty, injustice, oppression that I saw and witnessed, especially against women and the so-called lower castes. But even then, I knew it is possible to transform the most oppressive person or system with just the right mix of imagination, determination, and collective responsibility. So I spent my life working on crises because I felt every crisis actually offers a transition towards a positive transformation. So I worked on the crises and transitions from war to peace, from dictatorship to democracy, from the mutually assured destruction of the Cold War to the promise of planetary and human security. 
But the more that I worked with political and economic decision makers, I saw why it is that ideas that start off as utopia become dystopia. They get hijacked by what I call I-topia, the I of me and my idea, my ideology, my interests. It was when I came in 1999 to live in Ethiopia, then Uganda, and work on the conflicts across Africa, I saw something very different. When communities break apart due to conflicts that have nothing to do with them, they act in a very different way. They come together in a circle of inclusion. And there they share their best ideas, not just with statistics or facts or PowerPoints, but with words and stories and poems, with dances, with theater, with whatever best expresses what they think will serve the common purpose. And in that circle of deep listening and common purpose, looking at the whole and not dissecting it into parts, the solution emerges. Not the best idea of one person, but from collective intelligence, drawing on everyone's inspiration and commitment. And that's where, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a peace mission in Somalia, it fell into me. Our topia. This is what we in the world can do, together, looking at our world as all the indigenous people have known, as one community, one family. This universe as one family, where everyone's voice counts. And that has been my dream. I would love to share with you just a few of these voices from all the different parts of the world and some parts which are struggling and suffering so much today to share how they are living every day with dystopia and still dreaming of creating an utopia. We are the women of the Yuyachkani Theater in Peru. Yuyachkani is a Quechua word. It means I am remembering. I am imagining. We created the Yuyachkani Theater 30 years ago when we saw that the war was destroying not just our people, but our culture and our nature. We use community theater with our indigenous communities so they can revive our legends and traditions. We use community theater with our traumatized women so they can rebuild their lives. We use community theater with our youth who have lost their way so they can build a different future. What we do on the stage is what we dream of in our society. Estamos creando una utopia para todos. We are creating a utopia for everyone. We are the women of the Women's Studies Center here in Nablus, in Palestine. Each one of us women came here with our hearts broken with grief, with all that we had suffered in these decades of occupation and conflict. Here, we found a safe place to shed our tears to share our stories, 
to help each other to find a solution. Here, we found our inner strength. Here, each one of us became a community leader. Whether old or young, educated or uneducated, veiled or unveiled. And now, each of us goes into our communities and knocks on the door of women's hearts that are broken like ours. So these women can stand tall in the face of daily suffering and shape a different future for our children. We are the youth of Dara in Syria. This is where our peaceful revolution started. When the soldiers started to shoot at us, we gave them olive branches to show that all we wanted was peace and freedom. When they started to shell us from above, we didn't sit still. We organized ourselves. We formed the White Helmets, the Syrian civil defense units who rush into the bomb sites to save as many civilians as they can. You know, each barrel bomb is like an earthquake of 7.6 on the Richter scale. Every day, 55 barrel bombs are thrown on us. We created field hospitals, to treat the victims with whatever little medicines we had. We started civil society organizations like Olive Branch for our traumatized children so they could find a safe place to play and study and laugh before the next bomb. So many civil society organizations have sprung up. But we don't work separately, we all work together. Because we can see that everything is interconnected and we all share the same goal. Everything is interconnected. We are the women of the Women's Committee in the slums of Mumbai. You know, each one of us women, when we came here, our lives were a real tragedy, like a bad Bollywood movie. <laughs> but here, we found that we could come together in order to stop the violence in our community, full of rape and drunkenness, you know. So we realized if we want to change the world outside, first we must be willing to change ourselves. And for this, we must know ourselves. Then we realized, alone, there is nothing we can do. But together, there is nothing we can't do. So we created Action Task Force. Any time of day or night, if any woman is being violated, we quickly mobilize and we rush to the spot. Even we are carrying broom in our hand to show our strength and we intervene and stop the violence. We also have counselors who will sit with the husband and wife to try to stop the problem, you know. Now we have created a forum for dialogue with the leaders of economic and political societies. We are even changing the policies of this government. You see, we have seen, if you find your power inside and your power with each other, then you have the power to create any change in the whole world. Namaste. Huh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is the lesson that women around the world who've suffered so much come to know. 
that when we want to transform the world, we have to start with ourselves, and especially to recognize that the pain out there is a reflection of the pain in here, the pain that we are often too busy or too worried to actually address. But when we do, it opens up, and we find our greater strength. In 2007, 2008, I was working in Sri Lanka, heading an organization that was working on peace and human rights. And just when we thought we were making progress, actually, things moved backwards. The conflict worsened, and my life was targeted. Civil society and members of the diplomatic community mobilized and risked their lives to protect and defend me. Finally, I had to grab my 12-year-old son, Arjuna, and we fled the country. It showed me that people, even in a war, will come together to do what they think is right and to help others. But I myself got busy and neglected the pain inside that I felt. The shame that I had gone to help and I'd become a victim that had to be helped. The guilt that I was alive and safe and that people who had helped me were still dying in Sri Lanka and in other conflicts. And this taste of death that stayed within me right here and made me feel there was nothing I could give to life. But when I actually began to look at this pain and walk into it, it connected me to this well of compassion bigger than I'd ever known, which is the greatest gift I have in the work I do. It brought me even closer to dear friends like Silla Elworthy and other women around the world who shared this commitment to co-create together and invite women everywhere to co-create with us a world that would work for all. And above all, it reawakened my dormant creativity. So all the stories of all the people and communities that have touched and inspired me could flow through me in poet poems and songs and stories and performances without any background in art or theater ever, so that their voices could reach out to people around the world and awaken them and invite them to join this choreography of transforming dystopia into utopia and shaping together a world that would work for all. Thank you.